Let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity for us to give back, to be blessed by music. Now talk to us, speak to us, customize a message for us. In Jesus' name, amen. It was interesting to hear the presentation that we just heard and to talk about balance because tonight the message is how to achieve balance instead of running around stressed out. I'm going to start tonight with a quote that spoke to me because I tend to go and not have balance in my life if I am not careful. For the first 10 years, I've been married 26 years, but for the first 10 years of my marriage, I was, I was very good at what I did for my occupation, but not as good as a husband or a father. Because for me, my priority was work. I had to be successful. My identity and my self-worth was tied together with my production level. And it wasn't until about 15 years ago that God operated a change in me. And I'm going to share with you some principles that have been a blessing for my wife and myself. We were living in the same house, sleeping in the same bed, did not see each other. She went to bed around 9 or 10. At that time, I was out working. When I came home at 11, she was sleeping. In the morning, she went to work at 5.45 in the morning. I was sleeping. On the weekend was for church. And Sunday was for soccer. And we lived in the same house, didn't see each other. So how, how does God operate a change in a driven, stressed out person? Here's a quote that I want, to, I want you to help me with because there's a word in there. See, English is not my first language. So there's a word in there that's really hard to pronounce. What is it? No, it's you. <laughs> Why would you assume it was? <laughs> so read it out for me. You must what? Eliminate hurry from your life. Do you ever notice when you read scripture, if you read scripture, that Jesus was never in a hurry to go anywhere? That he didn't mind interruptions to his day? That he didn't say, I, I am on my way to do something else, I can't heal you right now. There's a really nice story about stressed out people. This is found in the book of Luke. Luke was a doctor. So he understood the emotional, mental, and physical and relational challenges of living a stressed out life. Luke knows and can diagnose somebody when they're always burning the candle on both ends. Luke knows the difference between being a human being and a human doing. Luke writes this letter about these two sisters. So let's read this story. Jesus and his disciples, right, right off the bat, how many people is that? How many is Jesus and disciples? He had how many disciples? 12, and him and Jesus is 13. So there's 13 men. 13 men. They were on their way to a village where a woman called Martha opened her home to him. They were really good buddies. Jesus and this family, really good buddies, really good friends. He always stopped in their house when he was around. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. 
13. Plus her and her sister. That's 15. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Now, let's put ourselves in this story. How do you think she said that? What kind of attitude did she have when she said that? What, kind, what, what, what was her voice, intonation like? What, how did she talk when she said to Jesus, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Did she have her hand on the hip? You know, when a woman puts her hand on the hip, it's like all over. Tell her to come and help me. Notice she never addresses, she never addresses her sister. This is like some passive aggressive stuff happening. And the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. But Mary, but only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Let me paint a, a picture. Jesus shows up to Mary and Martha's house without any forewarning. There is no cell phones. There is no fax machines. There's like three people that still use fax machines, but he didn't have any fax machines. He didn't have any telephones. He didn't have any email. He didn't have any instant messages. He didn't have any way to communicate with them. He just shows up in their house. And of course, she is stressed out because she's thinking, what am I going to prepare for 15 people? So she goes in the kitchen and starts putting things together that don't even go together. Have you ever had this happen to you? Have you ever been in your house? I'm talking to the women now because husbands are famous for this. I've done it to my wife. I said, we're going to have some guests. And she says, what day are they coming? And I'm like, now. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, you go in the kitchen, start putting things together, don't even go together, like tacos and spaghetti. It don't even go together. But at the end of the day, I don't know why it is. At the end of the day, there's food left over. She's stressed out. Because she's focused on the task. She says, I want to be able to be a good host. And it irritates her that her sister, instead of helping her, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him speak. Mary and Martha made three decisions, just like you and I need to make three decisions every day. Number one, you have to choose between the essential and the urgent. Another way of saying it is the important and the urgent. There are things in life that are essential. And there are things in life that are urgent. And sometimes we are so enamored and overwhelmed by urgent living that we forget the essential. The essential will be my relationship with God. The essential will be my relationship with my family. The essential will be... My relationship with my health. This is what Jesus tells Martha. My dear Martha. In the original, the Bible was written in Greek, the New Testament. In the original, the word Martha is repeated twice. Jesus tells Martha, Martha. He's drawing attention to her name. There's a reason why. You are worried and upset over all these details. In other words, if Jesus was having this conversation with her today, he would tell Mary, he would tell Martha, Martha, you are stressed out. Urgent living has gotten the best of you. What happens when there is no balance in our lives? What happens when we tie our self-worth with our production level, what happens when we run and run and run and don't rest? I call that urgent living. 
three things happen with urgent living. Number one, urgent living is self-perpetuating. I want you to turn to the person next to you. Once again, you can pick to the left or to your right. doesn't matter who. The one you like the least. <laughs> or the most. I don't know. Either one. Keep them guessing. I want you to read this phrase to them right now. Read it. Read it right now. Like, but look at them. You will. Can somebody do it to my wife also? She's sitting right here. You will never. Never. Say that word with me. Never. never. Loud. Never finish everything you have to do. Never. Urgent living self deceives you into thinking that if you only worked a little harder for a little longer, you will cut down your to do list. The problem is. It's a lie. If you don't manage your margins, if you don't set your boundaries, if you don't intentionally calendarize, calendarize, I'm using calendar as a verb, calendarize dates with your spouse or time for prayer, if you are not intentional, Urgent living is going to overwhelm you. There is never, you're going to die with a to-do list. <laughs> You'll be dead with a finger saying, one more thing. <laughs> urgent living is self-perpetuating. Number two, urgent living affects your priorities. When we are always running... Always on our phones, with no detox, always trying to do things, always trying to accomplish the next thing and send the next email and clean the next house. It starts to affect your priorities because if left to our own devices, our human mind will rationalize negative behavior and you, when you have conversations with yourself, you will rationalize negative behavior to yourself. And at the end of that self-conversation, you end up like the good guy. I know I'm neglecting my family. But it's because I want a better life for them. Oh, I'm a hero. Somebody applaud me. I know that I have not exercised over the last six months. The best the only exercise I'm getting is getting from my car up those stairs to this hall. I know, but it's because I want a better future for myself. If left to our own devices, we will rationalize our negative behavior and come out like the hero of the movie. It affects your priorities. When you're always going, you're always needing to justify why that needs to be done and why you haven't done the stuff that is essential. I know I haven't prayed in a while. I know I haven't spent time with God. But after I get through this season, that's going to change. And you've been saying that for the last three years. It affects your priorities. It did mine. I, 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 I thought to myself, I'm working for God. My family needs to understand. Isn't it crazy? This, my wife, when she makes presentations, she always says this. Isn't it interesting that we always think that our family will understand? We never say, my boss is going to understand. My co-workers are going to understand. My pastor is going to understand. We always say, my family needs to understand. They're the ones that need to suffer. Because of your stressed out status, 
you take out your frustration on the people that love you the most. It affected my priorities. There is always one more visit to make. There's always one more conversation to be had. There's always one more job to be done. I don't know if I, if I related this story to you last time I was here, but I remember leaving my daughter by herself in a thunderstorm in the middle of the night because I had to go and speak somewhere. And I rationalized in my mind, I have to go do something. I have to, I have to I'm working for God. The, the people over there need me. And my daughter was by herself in the middle of a thunderstorm. Lightning, thunder, wind, darkness. One hour and a half by herself. She was five years old. Hidden underneath the bed. When my wife got home, she was hitting underneath the bed. The thunderstorm was so intense, it knocked the lights out. So she was, the, the house was dark. No lights. She's underneath the bed crying hysterically. My daughter was five. She's 23 right now. She remembers that day like it was yesterday. She'll come and say, she'll come and tell me, Dad, I, I want to go to the store. Can I have some money? I'm like, Vanessa, you're married. Ask your husband. <laughs> but she looks at me and says, do you remember when I was five? <laughs> My wallet just comes out automatically. It affects your priorities. God, family, and health are superseded by urgent living. Number three, it affects your personality. When you are always giving and always working and always doing and never receiving and never resting and never pausing, it starts to affect your personality. You start to experience something called heart shrinkage. You, and, you, and, if, you, and if, if you're in any kind of service, and even with your family, you're going to start to resent people that infringe in your time, like your kids. Or a phone call, or your pastor, or somebody that comes in and wants some of your time because you've... You give, you're always giving. It affects your personality. Stress people, stress people. Now, let, 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 let me throw this illustration out there. I know that women are not the only ones that should clean the house. Men should clean the house as much as women. But if you're a woman here and you're cleaning the house and your husband comes in and he's sitting on the couch watching the all blacks and you're cleaning and you worked and he worked, but you came home, and you kept working, and he starts resting. How do you feel? Are you happy when you look at him? Do you say, honey, do you want me to get you a sandwich? <laughs> do you want me to rub your feet? Anything else I can do for you, my It starts to affect your personality. You start, you start resenting and having issues and static and stress between the, you and the people you love. The most. Now God is a wise God. He's an intelligent God. He's an all-knowing God. And he knew before he created man that we would have the tendency to have no balance. Our tendency as human beings is to have imbalanced life. We eat too much or we rest too much. Or we work too much, or we drink too much, or we fight too much. Our tendencies is extreme living. And because he knew that, he created something before the sickness arrived, God already had the remedy. And that remedy for our stressed out lives is called... The Sabbath. Notice when it starts. This is Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. This is even before man had sinned, even before stress had even entered into humanity. This is what God puts in place for stressed out lives. He says, the heavens and the earth 
And on the seventh day, verse 2, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. He blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. He rested. He blessed it. He sanctified it. He had the cure and the antidote before we had the illness. Just like he had a plan for our salvation before he created us. Nothing surprises God. Nothing catches him by surprise. Nothing happens in the world that he says, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? You messed up my plan. In scripture, the Bible the Sabbath is described as a gift. You must realize that the Sabbath is the gift to you. I was reading an article today from a secular magazine. It's a business magazine talking about the blessing of the Sabbath. When God gave the Sabbath to the Jews in the Ten Commandments, before they had an idea of what it meant. He, he wants us to understand that the Sabbath is a gift. It's not a burden. Sometimes we have seen the Sabbath as a burden. And there are other denominations and religions that have accused us of being legalistic because of our observance of the Sabbath. It's because we have not understood ourselves. The gift that is the Sabbath is not a burden, is not an imposition, is a gift. It's a weekly vacation. If your boss at your job would tell you, listen, from now on, every week on Wednesday, you have a forced vacation, would you fight that? Would you say, man, what an imposition. I want to come work. The Sabbath is a gift. Like an actual gift. Not the gift of fruitcake. And wind. Not the gift that you re-gift. Like an actual gift. Important. Essential. Over the urgent. The Sabbath keeps us from doing and worshiping too Twin idols, one of too much work and two of too little work. That was so that's in the Sabbath commandment, it was a six days you will work. So it's a, it's a commandment about work and it's a commandment about rest. Not just a commandment about rest, it's a commandment about work. We mirror God's rhythm. God's rhythm is we work and we rest, and then we work and we rest, and then we work and we rest, and we work and we rest, and we work and we rest. And that's what brings balance. Second thing. That Mary and Martha needed to understand, other than the essential and the urgent, is that there, there are two things in life, or two categories. One is best, and the other one is good. Now, my mom and my dad and my grandmother and my grandfather and my uncles taught me the difference between good and bad. But nobody explained to me growing up the difference between good and best. Nobody explained to me the difference between what is good and what is best. Notice once again that text. There's one thing that is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. There are things in life that are good and there are things in life that are better. For me, I'm a Hispanic. I my favorite meal is rice and beans. Every meal, if I could, I would eat rice and beans. Rice and beans are good. But if you have rice and beans and avocado and fried plantains, you know what fried plantains are? Do you know what fried plantains are? It's like a banana that is fried and it smells fantastic, and it's really good for you. It's not good for you, but it tastes fantastic. It's like really good. It's not good for you, but it's good. 
That's better. Taco Bell is good. But a nice restaurant is better. There are things in life that are good. There are things in life that are better. Now, you can worship God and pray to God any day. But why would you settle for good when best is available? Why would you say, I'm just going to settle for good when best is available, when your best life is out there to be had? Why settle for good when best is available? I see people settling for good all the time. We settle for good in our marriages. And I know everybody in here is not married. But many of us are. And I ask people, so how's your marriage? I do marriage seminars along with my wife, and we ask the couples, so how's your marriage? And responses are, uh, you know, not as bad as that guy. <laughs> Like, this is, why you ma this is why you got married? Is this, this the reason why you got married? Do you get married to like, like you know, it's, it's all right. We don't, we don't, like, don't want to, like, kill each other or anything. <laughs> Do you get married for, I don't want to kill each other or anything? Do you get married for, like, the blah? Do you, get married, do you get married for a beige? You know what the color beige is? The color beige is, like, brown, like, that, that color. Who's in love with beige? Who comes home and says, honey, I saw a beige building today. It was blew my mind. It was so awesome. It was fantastic. Beige. I'm so in love with beige. Who's in love with beige? Why settle for beige lives? Why settle for just... If you're going to be married, if you're going to decide to be married, shouldn't you have the best marriage possible? When you're in love and wake up every day thanking God for the person you married and the other person said the same thing about you. If you're going to, if you're going to be friends, doesn't it make sense you have the best friendship possible? If you're going to be a student, shouldn't you strive to best, be the best student possible? If you're going to be a worker, doesn't, doesn't, it, doesn't it make sense you be the best worker possible, not just mailing it in? It's just, I'm just going to pass by. I just want to be here so they don't fire me. I just want to do enough so I, I pass the class. I remember having a, a friend. We went to class together. We were in school together, and he wasn't the brightest. He wasn't the brightest. And I remember going to class, and he would bring me and say, come with me. Let's go talk to the teacher. We went up to the teacher and said, he said, I, I, was just, I wasn't even aware what, what he was going to say. He said to the teacher, teacher, what's the lowest grade we can get? We were wondering. Like, I, I wasn't wondering. Right? <laughs> Don't you hate when people say that? We were wondering. We were wondering, what's the lowest grade we can get and still pass the class? Is that a 68? Is that a 65? Is that a 72? What's the lowest grade? Like, is this the life you want to live? If you're going to be a Christian, doesn't, doesn't it make sense you be the best Christian possible, sold out for Jesus? If you're going to be a dad, doesn't it make sense you be the best dad possible? Why settle for good when best is available? If you want the best, and you, have, you want to have balance in your life, we're talking about the Sabbath. Why is this day so important? It's all through Scripture. If you were to, to get all this evidence and put it in front of a judge, you have enough evidence to say, all right, so I get what this, this day is all about. It starts in Genesis, where God, where, when God rested, called it holy, and blessed it. And then it keeps, in, it keeps going in Exodus. And Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Exodus has something called the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments are divided into four and six. The first four have to do with a vertical relationship. Your relationship with God. The last six have to do with a horizontal relationship. You and other people. And the Sabbath is commandment number four. That's the link between the horizontal relationship... And the vertical relationship is the link between the first four and the last six. You see, when Jesus was here, the Bible says that he had a custom. This is what he did every day. It's a custom. You have customs. You have things you do every day. Like you brush your teeth. Amen? I don't hear a lot of amens, but maybe you don't have. <laughs> maybe I misspoke. You have, you have customs. You have things that you do every day. 
Jesus had a custom. He went to church. He went to the synagogue. He worshipped. He respected the Sabbath. Mary rested on the Sabbath. That's Jesus' mom. The disciples, after the resurrection, worshipped on the Sabbath. Paul, after the resurrection, worshipped on the Sabbath. And in the new earth, the Bible says that we're going to worship on the Sabbath. Why settle for good when best is available? One of my favorite passages on, on this in, in Scripture about the Sabbath is this one. Because it's, it's, it paints a picture about what this day can be. And I know that maybe some of you have even either heard somebody who talked about this or experienced a different percep perception of the Sabbath. But let me just clear that out. This is Isaiah. He's a prophet. Very well respected. Wrote like a really long book. He said, keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interest on that day. But enjoy. Everybody say, enjoy. Enjoy. Do you associate the Sabbath with enjoyment? And speak of it with what? With delights. The Lord will be your delights. He will give you great honor and satisfy you with his inheritance. Enjoyment. Delights. Satisfaction. Delights. Inheritance. That's not a Sabbath of burdens. The Sabbath is not a day where you have a to-do list and not to-do list. The Sabbath is not a day of lists and no, you can't run, you can't do that, you can't listen to that, you can't, uh, no, no, no. What do you like? No, no. Sabbath is a day of rest, of balance. It's a day that you can connect with your creator. It's a day of delight. Now, once again, I was born in Cuba, so I like sweets. It's just part of my culture. I like something called guava pastries. They're amazing. If you've never tasted them, uh, you can come over to our house and eat some. It's about $2,000 for the plane ticket. So just come over. <laughs> you can stay in our house. Um, unless we're not there, then you got to stay in a hotel. But guava pastries are, are fantastic. Flan is fantastic. The Sabbath, I, I told her the other day, my mom used to give us this fish oil. Did anybody... Any other parents used to give fish oil to you when you were a kid? It's, have you given it to your kids? Like, you have to pass that on. <laughs> you, have, you have to pass that. I used to hate. It. Before bed, she's like, you have to drink this. My dad used to make us carrot juice every morning. Now, if you, I like carrots in soups. I don't like carrot juice. And some people, when I say this, they push back and they're like, mm, you used to I don't like it. <laughs> okay, sue me. I don't like it. <laughs> Every day in the morning, he used to have carrot juice. No sweeteners, no honey, nothing. Just carrot juice with carrot pulp in there. It's the most disgusting thing in the world. I'm thinking about it and I want to throw up a little bit in my mouth because of this carrot Drink it, he said, so that way you can have good eyesight. I used glasses, so that didn't work. <laughs> I hated it. I did not look forward to it. And some people, when they think about the Sabbath, it's not a day they look forward to it. Like, when are you happiest? Friday night at sundown or Saturday night at sundown? <laughs> well, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> And some people think that the Sabbath is something to be endured. But the Bible says Sabbath is not a day to be endured. It's a day to be enjoyed. It's a day that you can reconnect. Why? Here's why. Because it's a permanent blessing. And if you don't separate this one out of seven, you're missing a great opportunity. I want to finish with two things. Two things about the Sabbath that I want to clear some misconceptions about. Number one, the Sabbath is grace-oriented. Not a day of imposition and no's and lists. It's a day of grace. In Scripture, there are two places where the Ten Commandments are written out. One is Exodus. Exodus 20. Many of you know how to find that. 
The other one is a lesser known book called Deuteronomy. Like nobody reads Deuteronomy on purpose, right? Like you get there because, oh, okay, Deuteronomy. All right, maybe there's some good stuff. But there's some really good stuff in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has the same Ten Commandments that Exodus has. But it is preceded by a little phrase that gives context to these laws that God is giving. So instead of just looking at the law, let's look at the law in the context of the statement that's before it. Let's read it. Let's read it. It says, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 13 said, You have six days each week for your ordinary work. In order for you to know the meaning of the Sabbath, you have to not only know the what of the Sabbath, which many of us know, but you have to know the why. If you don't know the why, the what is going to seem like a drag. You have to know the why. So here's the what first. Six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, you or your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen or donkeys, and all the other livestock and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. That is the what. So how do I, well, what was this day about? That's the what. But here's the why. Here's the, here's the good news. This is the part that gets me excited. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with a strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. That's the why. This is what happened. The Israelites were living in a society that was production-based. No rest days. You worked in Egypt every day. The moment you could not produce anymore, you were killed. You are valuable as long as you perform. And God is telling them, listen, there is a different economy when it has to be with the heavenly economy. There's a different way of looking at life. You are not valuable because of what you produce. You are valuable because I loved you so much that I delivered you from that lifestyle. That lifestyle that we're always on. That there's never rest, that there's never balance, that there's no connection, that there's always go, go, go. I delivered you from it. That's why the Sabbath day is a great moment for us to come to church and remind ourselves that we are not human doings. We are human beings. And that God loved us so much that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. There is no obedience. This is the obedience part. There is no obedience without deliverance. You can't obey God unless you are delivered. That's why the Sabbath day is grace. It's a moment that I realize and I remember every weekend the life I used to have and the anger I used to feel and the concerns and the low self-esteem. And I remember the addictions and I remember how it used to be. But I also remember that God did for me what I could not do for myself. That's why when I go to church, I always like to sit in the front. I don't like to look at anybody's head. I like to sit in the front. And I like to worship God. And I like to get into the worship. And I like to get into the word. Because it's a weekly reminder that I am so valuable to God that he delivered me and did for me what I could not do for myself. Grace. Every weekend is an opportunity for you to say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. Sabbath is grace. Number two, the Sabbath is a great equalizer. Notice again. It says, you, we, we read this already. But it says, all your ma male and female servants must rest as you do. Here's, again, God. God is speaking to a people that are coming from a society where we had a ruling class and a slave class. He's coming from a society when you had the well-to-dos and the have-nothings. A society of people that have rights and people that have no rights. He says, listen, 
The Sabbath is a great equalizer. In the Sabbath, <coughs> there is no black and white. There is no islander and native born. There is no rich or poor. There is no educated and uneducated. There is no million dollar in the bank having person and zero dollars that you're praying that your checks don't bounce. There, in church, when we sit in church, it's a great equalizer. Because here tonight, there is somebody that drove here with a $50,000 car and somebody that came here with your car that is a motive of prayer. Because every time you're about to start it, you pray so it starts. It's like, please, Jesus, please, Heavenly Father, please, one more time. There's people in here that have PhDs, a couple of them. There's people here that barely have a sixth grade education. There's people here that come from wealthy families. There are people here that come from poverty. And here, nobody is better than anybody else. When we worship God, native born or foreigner, rich or poor, ruling class, or workers, we're all the same in Jesus Christ. That's what happens on the Sabbath. It's a weekly reminder that I'm not better than you because I have more than you. I have been to a lot of deathbeds. It's my profession, I, I'm with people when they're born. I'm with people when they get married. I'm with people when they die. I have never had a, a person that is almost dead tell me, Pastor, I have one more, more request. Please, take me outside so I can sit in my BMW one more time before I pass. Please bring me my awards from my wall so I can see them one more time before I go. Please, Pastor, let me see all those emails that people congratulate me on all the good work that I did. No, at the end of a person's life, they want to see their family, they want to see their loved ones, and they want to make sure they're right with God. If that's the case, why not start living now in the same way? The Sabbath is grace, and the Sabbath is a great equalizer. Fifteen years ago, just like I'm standing here today, I stood in front of a congregation of about 500 people and I said to the congregation I said I need to apologize publicly to my wife and my children because I have neglected them because I'm always working and I want to commit publicly that I'm going to have dinner in my house with my kids I'm going to help them with your, their school homework I'm going to do, go, I'm going to have a day off. I had no days off. I didn't have any days off. Because somebody told me, you, you, you can't take any days off. Because the devil doesn't take any days off. But the devil is a terrible role model. Right? Yeah. You, you, have, to, you have to, you have to take one day off where you can say, okay, this is a day that I can concentrate on something other than my work. So I told them, Mondays is going to be my day off. On Mondays, I told my congregation, uh, just like I'm telling you today, on Mondays, please don't come to my house, don't call me, don't die, don't get divorced, don't fight. And it's amazing what happened. As soon as I started putting my priorities the way that it should have been, I started having dates with my wife. And my kids knew that mommy and daddy went out, were going to go out on a date. Because the greatest gift you can give your kids is a solid marriage. So I need to make investments. Because eventually, that the people that I was pastoring are not going to be in my life. But my wife is going to be in my, in my life. So, dates with my wife. And, and, and time for exercise. And it happened that when I started putting priorities in my life, God operated and he blessed in other ways. The job that I was doing was blessed. It's amazing what happens when you understand that God 
is God and you are not. And you're not called to replace. You're not called to be all things to everybody. You're not called to, to, to take every phone call and do everything. If you don't put boundaries for yourself, nobody is going to put boundaries for you. People are going to suck the life out of you. And they're going to criticize you afterwards for looking pale. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, if you don't put lines of demarcation and like, okay, this is my family time and this is my health time and this is what I'm going to do. If you don't do that, nobody's going to do it for you. So 15 years ago, we started on that journey. And these three principles that I want to share, that I share with you today have helped us. When we need to make a decision, we have Is this essential or this urgent? Is this good or is this the best possible? And is this going to be permanent or is this going to be just a temporary thing? So I want to I wanna pray for anybody that's here today that needs to make that decision. You might have come here with some unbalanced tendencies. I can tell you that if God was able to change me, a driven Type A personality, task-oriented person who would just go, 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 go 16 hours a day. Because when you love what you do, it does not seem like work. If God can operate that change in me, for sure he can operate that change in you. Because you are way better and more spiritual than I was. So I'm wondering tonight, is there anybody that needs this prayer? Is there anybody that is here that says, Pastor, I need this prayer. I need to bring my priorities into focus. I need to be a better person, a better student, a better husband, a better wife, a, a just a better Christian, a better. I need to align these things with God's priorities. And I promise you God is going to do it for you as he did it for me. Who can I pray for tonight? Who needs this prayer? Who needs this? W would you uh, come with me here to this altar? Come, 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 come with, your, with, with your problems. Come. And uh, return to your seat with your, with your blessings. Come. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. But whoever needs this prayer, just come to the altar. Just come to the altar. This is not, tonight, is not, the prayer is not magic That all of a sudden you went for a prayer and then all of a sudden, whew, everything changed. No, this is the start. Coming to prayer is the start, the beginning of a journey. You're going to have, you have some falls, some drawbacks, some, some mistakes. But this is a public commitment that you're making. You have to be accountable to somebody to say, listen, I have these tendencies. I, I left by myself. I can't do it. So I need somebody to keep me accountable, to help me in this journey. All right? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you have not given up on us. And you have given us this great gift called the Sabbath for us to refocus and to remind ourselves that we are valuable to you. Not because of what we produce, not because of the works that we do, but because you created us and you saved us. And we are your sons and daughters. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your grace. And tonight as we make this decision... To try to bring into alignment our priorities with yours. We ask you that you will give us the power, the discernment, the humility to be corrected in this area. And that a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now, we might look back on this day as the day that this process started. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for listening to our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, every night you have a card. Tonight, because we talked about stress, we're going to give a massage so somebody can take out their stress. You've, you've been filling these cards. We pray for every single one individually every day. Last night, some people indicated that they wish to start anew and be baptized. We had three that said, 
This is the choice that they want to make. By the way, are we thankful that they made that decision? Yes. Make the round of applause. Yes, yes, fantastic. Oh, yes. There are some of you that are still thinking about it, considering it. Don't consider yourself pressured. Just invite it. If you've been thinking about it, you're a young person. I remember when I got baptized, my dad baptized me when I was nine. It was, I never forget that experience. You're a young person, you're considering this. Maybe you're somebody who's left and disconnected from God and wants to return to Him. Or somebody who's never had this experience. This week is your opportunity. At the, and during the weekend, myself and some of the local pastors were going to have a baptism. So you have to indicate it in the card if this is something that you want to do. Fix what you can fix and let God fix everything else. So fill out your cards. Pass him along, bring him up, and I'm going to give out this massage. Somebody that is stressed out needs this, right? This is not by chance. God has this for somebody here tonight. All right, tomorrow night's message, it's on finances. And Wednesday night, it's on relationships and family. So the next two nights are going to be super practical about stuff that all of us deal with. You know somebody who needs help in finances, we're going to pray about your finances tomorrow, bring him. You know anybody that needs help in their relationships? Single, divorced, married, grandparents, young people, bring him on Wednesday. Thursday night, we're going to have an anointing service for healing. Emotional, physical, mental, Spiritual healing, Thursday night. Then Friday and Saturday are our, are our last two nights. There is a table outside with some books that I wrote. Uh, there is a little box that says donation. If you don't have anything to give, take a book anyway. If you have something to give so you can pass it on, you leave a donation there. I wrote two books. One of them is... Failure is not final, and the other one's called We All Have Problems, the same title of, the, of, this, uh, of this week. They're, they're in a table outside. All right, pass them up to you, and at the end of the service, I am going to be here. If you want to come and have any questions about what I preach on, or want me to pray for you specifically, or just want to say hi, uh, I'm going to be here waiting uh, to talk to you. All right, bring them up. Perfect. They are on their way. For the longest time, I had never got a massage. Like, that was really foreign to me. And then my wife talked me into getting a massage. It's, it's fantastic. It just helps you. It's great. So if you have a chance to do it. Thank you, Pastor. Why don't you pick one today? Let's see. 